Good morning, everyone. It's always encouraging to the speaker when people sit near the front. <laughs> a lot of times people come and they sit near the back. And um, I want to tell you a little unique thing about myself. I am, uh, so far as I know, the only person in the North American division that's been to every camp meeting in North America. So that's very unique. You know, there's 58 conferences. There's lots of camp meetings. And I've been to this one, I think, is my third time, maybe four. But I'm really happy to be here. And the reason I say that about camp meeting is because I guess I could be an option and not come to camp meetings and just do my job at the office. But I enjoy camp meetings. One of the reasons that I do is because, you know, I get a regular monthly salary, but everybody that's here has come because they want to, and many people have taken off work and, you know, a special time for them. So I really want to make it worth your while. I will tell you that uh, my goal for the 11 o'clock session this week is to give you information that will uh, underscore the conviction of being involved in the Last Day Remnant Church and the truth of Almighty God. I will tell you that every time anyone questions any one of our teachings, I personally dig as deep as I can to find the truth about it. And this is my testimony. The deeper I dig, the more solid the foundation. It's incredible. I believe that we have a good, solid foundation for what we believe. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you also that when Jesus was speaking, most of the time, when you read like the Sermon on the Mount and others of Jesus' sermons, he was actually seated. I'm not going to sit down. I like to be standing when I speak. But I will just tell you that he actually gave things that you could jot down. So when you come to this meeting, especially the ones following in the rest of few days this week, bring your Bibles and bring something to write on. Jesus also uh, used illustrations from life. Most of you are aware that when he gave the parable of the sower, for example, people could actually see a farmer working while he was giving that illustration. When he gave the illustration of the ten virgins, they were actually able to see a wedding taking place. Are all of you aware of that? Well, when we're in a building like this, you can actually see out and see nature, but since you can't see uh, the illustrated things that I'm going to tell you about, I've decided to use my computer and uh, I'll use some PowerPoint, and I want to show you some Bible texts. Uh, what we're going to do is look at two of them from the Old Testament, and then two from the New Testament. And I want you to understand how important these are. The first one is Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant... Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, God is speaking to Moses at the occasion right before the chapter before the Ten Commandments were given. And he said in verse 6, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, if you wanted to compare that near the end of his life, right before the Israelites crossed over into the Promised Land, God actually, uh, through Moses, repeated the same thing. You're a peculiar people. And that's why I put down there Deuteronomy 14 verse 2 and Deuteronomy 26 verse 18. You are likely aware that the book of Deuteronomy is a series of three sermons that Moses gave to Israel before he died and before Joshua took them into the promised land. So we're going to look now at a couple of New Testament texts. Titus chapter 2. We're actually going to look at five verses here. The Bible is very, very powerful, and if you write these things down or look at them in your own Bible, you'll be able to see. I've actually put these here in the King James Version because that's the computer program I had to bring them over in, and it is also one that's most familiar to most of us. Someone asked me, why do we have so many Bible translations? And I said, well, I'm not really sure about that, but I know one thing, since we have so many, which one are we learning? Which one are we memorizing? Which one are we studying? And that's the important thing, really. So, uh, Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, our, of the 
the great God in our Savior, Jesus Christ. This was kind of like last week's Sabbath school lesson on the hope, you know, that we find in the Bible. And Titus 2, 14 and 15, now this is very interesting, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Those are the same words that are used in the Old Testament, zealous of good works. Now, if we had time to discuss this a little bit, what do you think it means to be peculiar? Not odd, not strange, not, you know, real unusual. Peculiar means special, kind of set apart. You know, this is very, very important to God, and, and you can see it, zealous of good works. And these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And then I like this last one, let no man despise thee. Now, I'm going to show you today in the title message, 100 to 1, that we are a very, very unique people. Now, when you get everybody together at camp meeting, we, everybody seems to be just alike. But when we're out in the world where we live, we're very, very unique people. And I'll show you what I mean by that. There's another one. We'll look at 2 Peter, 1 Peter 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, and verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. By the way, these are the exact words from the Old Testament. So God designed that his New Testament church also be special and unique and peculiar, if you please. That you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but now you are a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. So in the Adventist church, we have five unique teachings. Actually, with my department, we have six unique teachings, and that is that they, they all start with the letter S, and I'm going to show them to you here. First one is second coming, sanctuary, spirit of prophecy, Sabbath, and state of the dead. Seventh-day Adventists have unique understandings of the Bible in every one of those, some more than others. You say, well, everybody believes in the second coming of Christ. Are you aware, listen carefully, 95% of people who claim to be Christians believe that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come on this earth. Do you believe that's true? You understand what I'm telling you. We believe that everyone at the second coming, which is imminent, are going to be with the Lord in heaven and be with him a thousand years. Isn't that right? I mean, it's, it's uh, very unique. Uh, so we're going to look at, I'm going to go through these really, really quickly. These biblical topics were discovered early in Adventist history and have given us a unique perspective on life and a worldview that we call the great controversy theme. So I'm going to just look at these real quickly, but I want to focus in on one of them today. Second coming. It's fundamental belief number 24. I'm not going to read that to you. I'm just going to tell you that today the most popular series on end times that have ever been written are the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. Are you all aware of that? Somebody needs to tell Tim LaHaye that those that are left behind are all dead. <laughs> is that true? It is absolutely true. If you read it in Jeremiah 25, verse 33, maybe we should just turn there so you can see it in your Bible. I want you to know that what you believe is absolutely correct. So it's verse 25, uh, chapter 25, and we're going to look at verse 33. At that day... When you look at the Old Testament, by the way, when expression that day comes up, it is almost always talking about which coming of Christ, the second coming. And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuge on the ground. Why doesn't somebody bury these poor people? Because they're all dead. You understand. We have a unique teaching, but I believe it is a biblical teaching. Also, it is the end of the world as we know it. That is the second coming. And, of course, we have a timeline. That's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon in my seminar, the great prophetic timeline, so we can understand where we are in history. And, of course, signs of the end also. The sanctuary is our most basic of all the teachings of Adventism. It is very, very unique, and the people who try to undermine Adventism always criticize that one. That's why a couple of quarters back, we had a whole lesson on, what was it? Sanctuary. 
You remember the sanctuary, very, very important that we understand. And this, by the way, is fundamental uh, belief number 23. I'm telling you that because if you get one of the books of the ABC, the fundamental beliefs of Adventism, you can look it up. It's number 23. But we see the big picture of salvation history with this teaching. A compacted prophecy of the gospel. The earthly model of the sanctuary is the model of the heavenly sanctuary. We believe in a blood atonement. That's the lamb's blood was symbolizing Jesus' blood. And of course, I'm going to talk to some of you or the, who've come uh, about the Crozier article later. The spirit of prophecy is also a very, very unique teaching. It is quite amazing when you see it, really. It's the fundamental belief that we have number 17. I'm going to tell you this, and I'll repeat it later in the week uh, on one of the days, that uh, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul gives five gift lists. I'm only, I have all the verses up there, but I'll only mention the one from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 8, and then verse 11 to 15. The gift lists in the New Testament are very unusual because they're all different. You understand they don't all have the first one is the same, the second one the same, the third one. They're all different. As a matter of fact, there is only one gift in all five lists. You already guessed which one that is. It's the gift of prophecy. Very important that we understand that. Only prophecy occurs in all the gift lists. Someone told me uh, some time ago, I frequently speak with people I'm traveling on the airplane, and uh, someone asked me about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I was sitting by a man who was a Christian, and he said, uh, well, what, how would it compare to Baptist? And I said, well, we believe in baptism by immersion, and we believe in we're saved by faith in the Lord, and so on. And in fact, we have many things uh, similar in common with uh, Baptist. And he said, well, how are you unique? And I said, well, there's a couple of things that we're unique about. One of them is that we believe that Ten Commandments are still binding on Christians today. And so, as a result, we observe the Bible Sabbath. And he says, well, that's interesting. Is there anything else? And I said, yeah, we believe that the gift of prophecy is still uh, in evidence today. And he said, oh, really? Tell me about that. And I said, well, you know, these, these gift lists all include prophecy. And he says, well, I believe that. And I, he said, and I told him, we believe it was manifest in the life and ministry of Ellen White. He said, did you say Ellen, a woman? Give me a break. <laughs> so I said to him, I want you to remember what I'm going to tell you next, and you guys can write this down. 2 Kings 22. It's just three twos. 2 Kings 22. Do you remember that when Josiah, the boy king, became king, he was following a wicked king. They hadn't used the temple in years and years. And uh, as he became a man, about 18 years of age, then he started having the, the full power of the reign in his own hands. So he announced they were going to clean out the temple, start the worship of God again. And when they were doing that, they found a book of the law. It would be equivalent to finding the Bible. And the scribe came and told him that they found it. And he said, read it. So he started reading, and God was telling them what would happen if they were faithful and what would happen if they were unfaithful. And the king ripped his clothes and said, we're as good as dead. Call the prophet. Find out what we should do. So they called the prophet, and the prophet said, because you have a heart that's right and wants to do what is right to God, this great calamity is not going to come while you're king. It's going to come sometime down in the future, if you obey the Lord. So they had this great revival. In fact, the Bible says it was the greatest revival in all of the history of Israel and all the history of Judah. The prophet was a lady named Huldah. I told this man. He says, Huldah. Maybe in Hebrew that was a man's name. <laughs> I said, well, if you read carefully in 2 Kings 22 and 23, it says she was the wife of a certain man, and she was a prophet. So I get the idea it was a woman. You get the idea that God is willing to use those who are willing, and this is important that we understand. Okay, we're going to go along here real quickly. Sabbath is very unique to us. Fundamental belief number 19. We base it on the fact, and by the way, I teach stewardship on a regular basis. You know what my favorite stewardship text is? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If he's the creator, what does that make me? I'm the creature. Do you understand? He's the owner and I'm the manager. 
I'm never going to be the owner because he's the one who made it and owns everything. It's very, very simple. But from creation, the fourth commandment, three angels met. Those kinds of things are rather unique, as you know. And then, of course, we believe that God's uh, law is unchanging in its nature. The state of the dead is very unique. Also, I'm just going to point out the truth on this topic helps us to prevent belief and practice of spiritualism. Do you know that there are some teachings in the Bible that it really doesn't matter what you believe about it because you're going to get straightened out on that when you get to heaven, right? I mean, you don't have to know whether or not you, you're alive or, or you're conscious or whatever. The only reason that we have a correct teaching on the state of the dead is so that we're not deceived by spiritualism. It's very, very important. You know, whether the millennium's on this earth or in heaven, those things, uh, you know, but in God's great plan, you can see how they fit in so nicely. Time Magazine, Christianity Today, Christian Century, all feature cover stories on Mary. And these are, of course, in the Protestant world. Now, why do I mention Mary? You understand Mary. This is interesting to me because a belief, I would just first tell you, the majority of prayers spoken by Roman Catholics are addressed to Mary. Very, very interesting. Now, this is, this is just a known fact. What I'm going to tell you next is we believe that Mary is dead and resting in her grave in a state of unconsciousness till the Lord returns. That's the biblical view. But spiritualism is the belief that there's conscious existence after life on this earth and that those people can either talk with us or hear us. Mariology, by definition, is pure spiritualism. Do you understand? That's why I'm mentioning this to you. When someone dies, he sleeps with his fathers, according to the Bible, and rests until the resurrection. Man has a soul or is a soul. He is a soul, a living being. And then just because I'm who I am, I'll tell you about stewardship real quickly. This is important. God is the owner of everything. Tithe is holy and belongs to God. These are the unique teachings. By the way, many of you have, have studied the crown materials, which I really appreciate. You know, crown ministries, formerly Christian financial concepts. Uh, the crown materials, I've taught it in my home, and, and I feel very blessed by it. But they don't understand tithe as we do. Holy and special for God to be used for the support of ministry only. You understand? Uh, to someone who doesn't understand biblical tithing, anything you give to a charitable cause could be uh, your tithe. Even your children's education, all those kind of things. Very interesting. Any help you do to any charity, that's part of your tithe, some say. But we believe it's holy and belongs to God. The offerings, on the other hand, are the primary evidence of what we think about God and his blessings. Now, here's a real interesting one for us. Since God is the owner of everything, what should we do with our stuff when we're done with it? How does give it back to him sound? Isn't that interesting? Just think about it. <laughs> this is interesting. The words well done are spoken to those who manage their money Christianly. Because of the relatively small size of our denomination, we are actually in a minority position from Christian perspective in all of these beliefs. History provides a background and prophecy underlines the certainty that there will be difficult times ahead for those who are willing to stand for God and are willing to be in the minority position. That's what I'm going to talk about in the balance of the time that we have. My reason for sharing this series with you now, I'm going to talk about signs and other kinds of things in the seminar, but now how to be ready is to me the most important thing. You're to prepare our hearts and minds to stand for truth. We're going to look at a few Bible illustrations and a few current illustrations, and then we'll review our situation as it currently stands. The Seventh-day Adventist Church celebrated last fall 100 years in the country of Belarus. One of the vice presidents of the General Conference came back and said he had just been there, and they had celebrated their 100th anniversary. But you have to wonder, because if you look in the Adventist Encyclopedia, it says that the work there began in 1924. And 1924 to 2006 isn't 100 years, as you can understand. It happens that the work did begin in 1906. But it's very interesting because in those days, 
in the former Soviet Union, there was no access to get information out, and the records of the government were kept, you know, secret and so on. It's an interesting time during the Russian Empire when anyone who followed a religion was a worshiper of God was a person under great suspicion. The church leaders in various parts of the empire were often sent off to reorientation camps in the far north of Siberia. Apparently that happened to a number of our leaders. One of the stories that we have just learned from Belarus, and this was the pioneer worker, Mr. Libsack, started the work in what is now Belarus. He set up a few companies of believers and traveled around giving Bible studies and training people, but always under the threat of being arrested. One day, as he was meeting with a group of believers, the security forces came to take him away. As they were escorting him out, just imagine this happening at your church. As they were escorting the pastor out, he turned back and said to the believers, continue on after I'm gone. The work of God is like a river. It cannot be stopped. Now, that's incredible. To me, that's a very amazing thing. Uh, some of the stories, I'm just going to mention the three Hebrew boys. Uh, it's amazing always only because of the application. And so I'm going to read to you really quickly one of the statements that I found from that time. Important are the lessons to be learned from the experience of the Hebrew youth on the plain of Dura. In this our day, many of God's servants, though innocent of wrongdoing, will be given over to suffer humiliation and abuse at the hands of those who are inspired by Satan and are filled with envy and religious bigotry. Ellen White went on to say that those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment are the ones who will be accused of wrongdoing. And at last, the universal decree will go forth. The season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. And there's much more that we could mention about that. I want to tell you just briefly about John the Baptist. A lot of people don't know this about John the Baptist. What I will tell you next, his entire ministry was six months long. Three months he was preaching a free man, and three months he was in prison, and then his head was chopped off. This is a very interesting story about him, but I want you to see what happened with John the Baptist. Jesus said of him, this is John the Baptist, after his murder, it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of the Synoptic Gospels, of those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. The Luke one is Luke 7, 28. But here's what I want to show you. Why didn't Jesus intervene on John's behalf? Could he have done so? No question. Here's what Ellen White says, Desire of Ages 224. Gladly would he have delivered his faithful servant, but for the sake of thousands who in years after must pass from prison to death, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom. As the followers of Jesus should languish in lonely cells or perish by the sword, the rack or the faggot, apparently forsaken by God and man, what a stay to their hearts would be the thought that John the Baptist, to those faithfulness Christ himself, or to whose faithfulness Christ himself had borne witness and passed through a similar experience experience. So John would be a helpful. Now in that context is this awesome statement that all of you know from page 224. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and earn the glory of the purpose for which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. And notice down below that what part I have in the gold there. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. Isn't that incredible? When you think about it, the Bible predicts a time when the freedoms that we enjoy in America will be uh, curtailed, not practiced. I'm just going to give you the reference to read because I have a lot to tell you in the time that we have. So I want you to understand Matthew 24, verses 8 to 22. I'll just read the very, verse, verse 9. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and so on. This is, this is a Bible uh, uh, prediction. 
Now, here's where I got the topic for the sermon today, a very, very interesting one. Most of you are well aware that in the last national election, the Democratic Party holds a majority in the United States Senate. Does everybody understand that? Now, the interesting part, though, I said majority, but if just one Democrat became a Republican, then the Republicans would be in the majority. Do you understand? So it's like 4951. It's very, very close. So that's kind of unusual ratio. Very interesting. I'll just tell you one other case. About a month ago, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, handed down its decision in the case of Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Wednesday, April 18, uh, newspapers, of course, all across America had that on the front page because it was one that they upheld a state law banning partial birth abortion. Now, it was a 5-4 decision. That means four were opposed to the majority view and five of the justices voted in favor of it. It only takes five to make it law. If you had a case before the U.S. Supreme Court and you got a 5-4 decision against you, what is your appeal process? There is none. That's the court of last resort in America. It's very interesting also that in that particular decision, it, the majority opinion was written by Anthony Kennedy, and he was joined by Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito. All five Roman Catholics voted in favor of that law, which is interesting, and it is the law of the land in America. Now, I'm going to show you something very interesting now, and I'm going to talk to you about a real majority and a real minority. You're going to be able to see it here. There are 2.1 billion Christians in the world. Now, most of you here are internet savvy, and you can get on the internet and study stuff, so I'm just going to tell you that. There's a website called adherence.com. It's A-D-H-E-R-E-N-T-S, adherence.com. And you can find out the, the number of people that are of religious persuasion of any religion in the world. They will tell you the religious belief of every U.S. senator, every congressman, every judge, all the governors of the United States, and so on. It's kind of an interesting website to look at. But from there, you can learn that there's 2.1 billion Christians in the world, and that's all Christians, Protestants, Catholics, and so on. Of that group, nearly 20 million are Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. Does everybody understand that? Now, listen carefully. Simple math, if you divide 2 billion by 20 million, you get 100. So that means that for every Sabbath-keeping Christian, there are 99 Sunday keepers, including Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Charles Stanley, D. James Kennedy, Billy Graham, Charles Swindoll, the list goes on and on. Now, I'm going to give you a little illustration so that you can understand why this could be significant. And here it is. How could the 1% be right? Ellen White states, and I wrote it in my book, Sunday's Coming, a number of years ago, that when the Sunday agitation begins, the strongest pressure on people to conform is the fact that they're in such a minority. How could you guys be right? I'm going to illustrate it another way. Suppose that you were on a game show on TV and you were given a question that had three answers, A, B, or C, the three options. Suppose that if you answered the question correctly, you could win a million dollars. But you're really not sure of the answer. So according to the rules of the game, you can ask the audience for help. So the game show host repeats the question to the audience of 100 members and asks them to vote for A, B, or C. What if one person voted for A and 99 persons voted for B? You understand? You've seen these little graphs that shoots clear up to the moon. One guy down here, 99 on the other one. Which one would you go for for the million dollars? Well, as we say... You know, it's a no-brainer. How could I be wrong, even if I was thinking it was A? If 99 out of 100 just says it's, it's B. Is it possible that the one guy who voted for A could be right? Of course, it's possible, but not very likely. So for the million dollars, most people go for B that's supported by 99% of the audience. But now listen carefully. If the question were, which is the 
Bible Sabbath. I'm going to put this up here in a little picture so you can see it. Which day is the Bible Sabbath? Is it A, Saturday, the seventh day of the week, B, Sunday, the first day of the week, or Friday, the sixth day of the week? Now, this is interesting because the correct answer would be A, even though 99% of the audience would choose B. Is that correct? Now, if you don't believe what I'm telling you is true, or you're not sure about your answer, would you stake a million dollars on A, or even your life, or what about your eternal life? With such overwhelming odds against you to choose A, the Bible Sabbath. Most of you are very well aware that when Sunday laws begin in America, people will leave our church like rats jumping off a sinking ship. Did you hear what I said? We know it's true. Praise God that when that happens, honest and sincere people out there will join us in greater numbers than the ones who left. This is interesting. What makes some people willing to stay and others willing to join at that time? I believe there are three reasons, and I'm going to share them with you so you can understand about them. To me, they're very, very interesting. The first one, the people that stay or the people that join at that time, they know Jesus as the creator of heaven and earth. And I know what I'm going to say next sounds kind of crude, but I believe it's true and maybe it's the best way to understand it. They know that God has the power to recreate them in an instant, even though they may be burned at the stake or run through a meat grinder. Do you understand? You have to believe he is the creator of heaven and earth. You, there's, there's no way out of it. The second one is interesting also. They believe that the Bible is the inspired of word of God and is the only standard for faith and practice. And they know what the Bible says. This is kind of interesting. And I believe you could even add they've memorized large portions of it. And they probably can name them off as many, much as many people can name their favorite NASCAR driver or their favorite baseball player. The next one I'm going to show you, the third one, they have developed such a faith and confidence in God that they are willing to lay down their lives, lay them on the line if necessary to stand by Jesus and his word. Now, I know that I'm really speaking rather plainly this morning. I believe that's why you came to camp meeting. So I'm going to tell you these three elements are not developed in the life of a person by watching TV or playing video games. Do you understand? Time is short. You have to understand there's got to be stuff packed into your head during these times. It comes about by diligent prayer, Bible study, and the resulting gift of confidence and faith in God. Now, it's very, very interesting. I'm going to tell you a little story. A number of years ago, a couple living in Oxnard, California, decided that they were going to read the Bible through together. That was the first decision. The second decision is that they were going to obey it. Whatever they came to, they were going to do it. Well, they didn't get very far, as you can imagine, when they discovered the Seventh-day Sabbath. I mean, it's like Genesis chapter 2. You understand? And when they got over to Exodus, there it was again. So they decided to start keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath as they found it in the Bible. Now, this is interesting because one day during the week, they were in the midst of doing some remodeling work at their house. They went to a Lowe's building center in Oxnard, California, and they bought uh, materials larger than stuff they could carry on their pickup or their car. And so they said, not to worry, we'll deliver it to you. And the man said, could we bring it over Saturday? And he said, no, that's my Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath on the seventh day. And the guy at Lowe's said, well, you must be a Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, a what? <laughs> now, we think everybody knows who we are, you understand. But this guy's living in California, the most populous Adventist state in America, with four conferences. Never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist. So it did, you know, they brought it a different day. But it did spring in his mind, there must be other people that keep Sabbath. So we looked up the Oxnard Adventist Church, and the next Sabbath he went there. And they welcomed him and... Uh, learned of his testimony, and the man was later and his wife baptized into the Adventist church. 
I'm going to make a statement now that I think is true. I've never had anybody contradict it. Lots and lots of people have become Sabbath keepers by reading God's word. No one has ever become a Sunday keeper from reading this book. Now, you understand you've got the weight of evidence on your side. This is very, very important to understand. Now, listen carefully. Currently, people are having a big discussion about the Sabbath. I've never met a person who believes that Sunday was the Sabbath of the Old Testament. Sometimes we forget that the Old Testament was the Bible of Jesus and the disciples, and it was this scripture, the Old Testament, that they were encouraged to study. But the current Pope, Benedict XVI, and many evangelical leaders like D. James Kennedy and many, many others, are now teaching that Jesus and the apostles changed the day. That day from worship from Sabbath to Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Is this true? Well, it's true they teach it, but it's false information. I'll just tell you that. There was a time during the Protestant Reformation when all Christians, Protestant and Catholic, knew and put in the majority writings that they had, their major publications, that the church had changed the day and not Jesus or the disciples. Now, I want you to understand something incredible. I'm going to show you now, in the next couple of minutes, three major historical sources for this information, so you will understand. When that time comes, I'm sticking with the Sabbath. I know it's right. I know Jesus didn't change it. I mean, is it possible that Jesus changed it? Well, it's possible, but did he do it? No. The whole point is it's very, very interesting. So I'm going to show you some things that are very, very interesting to me. Two things from the time of the Reformation. One of them is that Charles V, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, called an Augsburg Confession, a diet at Augsburg. So I'm going to read this to you so you can understand. It's very interesting to me. Charles V, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, called together the princes and the cities of his German territories in a diet or a assembly at Augsburg. He called upon the Lutheran nobility to explain their religious convictions. In other words, why are you guys going with the Reformation and Luther instead of staying with the mother church? To this end, Philip Melanchthon, a close friend of Martin Luther and professor of New Testament at Wittenberg University, was called upon to draft a common confession for the Lutheran lords in free territories. The resulting document, remember Charles V said, I want this in writing and I want you to tell me it. You, 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 have, you have to stand up in front and tell me what this is all about. So the resulting document, the Augsburg Confession, was presented to the emperor on June 25, 1530. Now listen about it, and then I'm going to show it to you. What I'm going to show you right now, most of you have never seen before. I know this is true because it's typically not taught in Adventist schools, and I, I actually have been to uh, two PhDs who teach in Adventist schools and showed them this. They didn't know it. One even had his PhD in, in Reformation history. But anybody here today can get on your internet on the computer and Google the words Augsburg Confession, and the thing comes right up. This is on the Lutheran websites, the Augsburg Confession. Here's what Daubigny's History of the Reformation stated. Ellen White quoted this in the Great Controversy, page 207. The Augsburg Confession was the greatest... going to get 28 articles. So you can scroll down right away to article 28. It's the last one. And here's the relevant portion. They were asked, you remember, why are you going with Luther and the Reformation instead of staying with the Mother Church? And here's what they said. Moreover, it is disputed whether bishops or pastors have the right to introduce ceremonies into the church and to make laws concerning meats, holy days, and grades. There is, that is, orders the ministers and so on. Here's what they said now. This is all a quote, the whole thing. They, the bishops, refer to the Sabbath day as having been changed into the Lord's day, contrary to the Decalogue, as it seems, and neither is there any example whereof they make more than concerning the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power of the church, since that is dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Now, what I'm telling you here, I'm going to show you a conclusion. What we now know is an absolute certain historical fact that is in the Protestant church and civil leaders knew and stated in the Augsburg Confession. Remember, these men were not theologians. They were the German princes. They're like the governors of states. 
And when they came, they stated in the Augsburg Confession, which I call the Magna Carta of Protestantism, that the Catholic Church, not Jesus or the disciples, changed the day of worship from Saturday the seventh day to Sunday the first day of the week. At the time of the Reformation, this was common knowledge. I'm going to show you two more very quickly. One is that the Council of Trent, and it's a, a big deal. I'm just, I only put this up here. You can't read it, so I'm just going to read the first three lines there. This is a book I bought on the Council of Trent, the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. In, 15, or excuse me, in 25 separate sessions from 1545 to 1563, the Council Fathers met an ecumenical council at a small town in the Austrian tree old named Tritium, or in English, Trent. That meeting, the Council of Trent, produced a large number of canons decrees, condemned the errors of the Protestant Reformation, and shown as a beacon to all the world. Of the 21 ecumenical councils of the Catholic Church, the Council of Trent is universally regarded as the greatest. By the way, this is from Tan Press, a Roman Catholic book that I purchased just to get this little article out of it. But I want to show you something. The Council of Trent was set up by the Roman Church to uh, find the errors in, in Lutheran theology, Protestant theology. And they wrote back to the Pope over and over again and to the cardinals, these men who were studying at the Council of Trent, if we go by the Bible alone, Luther is right. And then they said to them, but this can't be, we'd have to change everything. And so something amazing happened. I found this, by the way, and some of you have read my, my latest book, uh, Sunday's Coming, the second edition. Uh, I've talked about this in there. The Council of Trent... This is the history of the Council of Trent. This book was 330 years old, the English translation, when I was holding it on my lap typing this. And this is really, really incredible to me. A Roman Catholic priest who was alive at the time of the Council of Trent gathered all of the news clippings, all of the happenings there, all of the documents, and put together uh, a history of the Council of Trent. And so I'm going to read to you what he stated. This is very interesting. Therefore, in conformity of the resolution, when the 18th day was come, uh, a procession was made of the whole clergy of the city. Now, this, remember, is the 18th session of the 25 sessions. Uh, the divines and prelates, who besides the cardinals were 112 that did wear mitre, that is the pointed hats, accompanied by their families and by many country people armed and going from St. Peter's Church to the cathedral, where the cardinal of Mantua sang the mass of the Holy Ghost and Gasparo del Faso, Archbishop of Reggio, made the sermon. His subject was the authority of the church, the primacy of the pope and of the cardinals. Now, here's the incredible part. He said that the church had as much authority as the word of God and that the church hath changed the Sabbath ordained by God into Sunday and taken away circumcision formerly commanded by his divine majesty and that these precepts are changed not by the preaching of Christ but by the authority of the church. Now, this is incredible. This is what turned the whole council of Trent. The authority of the church is higher than the scriptures. Turning himself to the fathers, he exhorted them to labor constantly against the Protestants, being assured that as the Holy Ghost cannot err, so they cannot be deceived. Very, very, very interesting. About three weeks ago on Sabbath, I was speaking in Battle Creek, Michigan. And I spoke, this is the first time, that was the first time I've ever given this presentation, which I'm sharing with you now. And after church, a man, the pastor of the church came up and said, did you know that there was a Roman Catholic in the audience today? And I said, no, but when you have a large audience, there's lots, there's guests and friends, there's people of all backgrounds. So what I'm telling you is documented evidence that you can go and find in the library. Do you understand? This is not just something I read in a little book or something. The whole point I'm going to tell you is that this man came to me at the dinner afterward, the Roman Catholic man, who, by the way, was raised to Seventh-day Adventist, graduated from the seminary at Andrews University and became a Roman Catholic. Because he took hook, line, and sinker, this Protestant idea that Jesus and the disciples changed the day. So by the grace of Almighty God, I had just done some research, what I've shown you right up here now. I asked this man, who is the most famous Roman Catholic theologian? If you read any Roman Catholic theology, the answer is Thomas Aquinas. In fact, they call him St. Thomas Aquinas. I don't know if I put the, yes, 1225 to 1274. So he lived 49 years during the Middle Ages. And he wrote a five-volume work called Summa Theologica. In volume three of that work, it's question and answer form. So it's question 122, article four, reply to objection for relevant portion. Now, this is the citation of the law. We don't do it this way, but that's the best way you can find it. You can find it on the internet doing what I just showed you. 
in his reply to uh, question four, he stated, in the new law, the observance of the Lord's day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the precept, that is God's law, but by the institution of the church and the custom of the Christian people. Isn't that incredible? So you have here three historical sources that will give you the basic understanding that the church did the changing, not Jesus and not the disciples. The 1% are right. Take the Bible and the Bible only as your source of faith and practice. You will be a Seventh-day Sabbath keeper. Don't ever forget that. By the way, you will be challenged on that over and over in the future. So in the last couple of minutes that I have, I'm going to show you something very interesting. A look of what, at what is ahead. This is from Evangelism, page 236. The law of God through the agency of Satan is to be made void, but in our land of boasted freedom, religious liberty will come to an end. The, the contest will be decided over the Sabbath question, which will agitate the whole world. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing here. Uh, this, by the way, you can see LDE at the bottom there, 145. That's the little book, Last Day Events. So you don't need to look at anything else. Just It's in Last Day Events. I just picked a bunch of them out here. Those who live during the last days of this earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God because they know that the argument in favor of the fourth commandments, uh, commandment are unanswerable. Isn't that incredible? They will simply say, we have a law, and by our law, you ought to be judged, and so on. There are others. There will, uh, Adventists will be treated with contempt. There will come a time when, because of our advocacy of Bible truth, we shall be treated as traitors. Now, I don't know if you know what that means or not, but if you have your eyes to the ground in the last few years and your ears to what's happening, have you ever heard of the Patriot Act? You know what happens to traitors? You understand. So what I'm telling you today is very, very important. You have the evidence on your side. I remember the first time I had a case in court. It was a very unique one. It was in Calhoun, Georgia. And the very day that I was in court, the famous criminal lawyer, Bobby Lee Cook, came in. He's the one that drives a Rolls Royce to court, you know. He came in and was just walking around like he owned the place. It was incredible. He came up to me and said, I understand this is your first case. I said, yes. He said, you've got to win that one. That's the one that's always the best one. You've got to win it. And then he told me something very interesting. If you've got the law and the facts on your side, you'll win the case, unless you're stupid. Isn't that incredible? Unless you do something goofy, you've got to win the case if you've got the law and the facts on your side. Now, what I'm going to tell you, you've got the law and the facts on your side. Do not give up. This is very important to understand. Very, very important to understand, no matter what. Well... I don't know that I need to give you more about this. I do want to just tell you something very, very amazing. I'm going to go real quickly down to a picture that I have at the end, so you're going to be able to see something to me that is very important. Have you ever heard of the Council of the Tower of Constance? Uh, some of you who've traveled in Europe probably have seen it. It's quite an amazing place. I have a picture that's kind of fuzzy. I'm going to show it to you anyway, because as best I can tell, there's only one window. It's just a tiny little place. It's just like a big silo. And the reason that that's significant is that many, many years ago, a young girl was put in that place. Marie Durand was her name. She was 15 years old. She was honest and generous and very much in love. She was looking forward to her wedding day with great anticipation, but that day never came. Rather, she spent her wedding date and many, many days after it in the most miserable prison in France. How did she end up there? What was her crime? How could she get out? Marie's family had come under suspicion for being Protestants. When soldiers arrived at her home looking for her brother, he was not there, so they arrested Marie instead. She was dragged to this dreaded Tower of Constance, where she was to remain in stark isolation. At any moment, she could taste freedom once again, rejoin her love, 
and begin the life that they had dreamed of together. But the only price was renounce her faith. Marie could not renounce her faith. Instead, in small letters, she wrote, scratched over and over on the miserable walls of her cell, resist. If you've visited there, some of you, it's all over the walls. Resist, resist, resist. And resist is precisely what she did. Not for a day, not just a month, or even a year, but for 37 years. The prime of her entire life. This Huguenot Protestant was finally released on December 26, 1767. But her father and her fiancé had both been executed while she was incarcerated. Even to this day, the word resists, you can see it on the wall. People go there to see the evidence of the resolve of a 15-year-old girl, a girl whose faith could not be broken. I'm reminded again of the words of Jesus, I will build my church in the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. That is Matthew 16, verse 18. And so the words of that pioneer worker in Belarus, Lebsack, repeated the truth of Jesus' statement when he said, the work of God is like a river. It cannot be stopped. It's going on, my friends. I'm going to suggest staying with the boat. It's very, very important that we do that. I hope that what I share with you during this time, the balance of the week, will be a comfort to you and help you to understand the kinds of things that God has told us to do to be ready for what we see coming on the earth. It's time for us to have our benediction, so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, if you will. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have this good evidence down through Scripture and history of the value of faithfulness to you. We thank you for the Word of God that we have that we can hold on to. And I pray that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible writers will inspire each one of these with the commitment that we need to be faithful to you and to be willing to stand even for a minority position. I pray that you'll bless us now as we're dismissed from this meeting. And may this be a good day and a good camp meeting time for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International Copyright 2007. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, Why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon. Coming soon.